conference is uh, sponsored by the Committee for Religion. Uh, we haven't heard much about religion today, but it seemed to me that all of the discussion raised the very fundamental questions that in many ways are a challenge to uh, religious practices and theology. Um, Art Frank's uh, talk uh, as the final paper um, does raise many questions about ethics and morality, and it may well be that we get on to a discussion of religion as a consequence of his paper. Art Frank has been at the forefront of the sociological debate about the body from the 70s, if not before. Um, he wrote a very influential paper about bringing the body back into sociology very early on, which was in the journal Theory, Culture and Society. And because of his own personal history, went on to consider questions about uh, health and illness, narratives, um, survival from major bodily crises, cancer and so forth. And um, has really carved out a kind of new area of um, sociology and humanities, which is concerned with the um, healing properties, if you like, of narrative accounts of illness. And um, almost and probably started a social movement for survivors in relation to the form of, of this. So without more ado, uh, welcome Art Frank to the Graduate Centre. Thank you, Brian. It's, uh, it's one of the great things about getting old in academia is Alfred Schutz wrote about growing old together and uh, I think of our work as having grown old together. It's, it's just delightful to, uh, to be here. Um, as Brian was just saying, this, this occasion is, is a hybrid. Uh, because on the one hand, we're, we're celebrating um, the, the almost culmination of, of this book that will be, will be out actually next month. Um, and on the other hand, we have funding, which I think I'm probably the primary recipient of from the Religion Committee. Uh, so my apologies in advance if my remarks tend to suddenly veer off in other directions, but, but at that point in writing the talk, I was thinking of, of another audience that would be here and, uh, and wanting to address them. I really like epigrams. Um, in, in fact, I, I mean, just my last book will be absolutely nothing but epigrams, and I'll leave out the text entirely, and it'll be much better. Um, so let me begin with one that seems appropriate from a, a hybrid book um, by a, a, a Croatian novelist who, whose name I believe will be pronounced Dubravka uh, Ugrezic, um, but I'd be grateful to be corrected if I'm wrong about that. And the, the book has the wonderful title, uh, Baba Yaga Laid an Egg, which is a, a different kind of book than we've heard about for the rest of this afternoon. Um, and she writes in there, in the absence of all ideologies, the only refuge that remains for the human imagination is the body. Now, after I read that, I, I then came across a quotation of William Blake, uh, who said a long time ago, the body is the eternal imagination of the soul. Um, so Lagrange isn't being maybe quite as original as she might or she might have read Blake. Uh, I think this statement, either Lagrange or, or Blake, uh, says something significant about why academics turn to the study of the body, or what we hope the body can do for us in turning to the study of the body, um, as we make the body the focus of our research. But, but to go back to this quotation, what does Agrazitz mean when she says, in the absence of all ideologies? Uh, if anything today, we seem to confront an overload of ideologies, uh, including religious fundamentalisms, militant atheisms, a proliferation of what could be called identity particularisms, uh, and of course the ideology known as neoliberal capitalism. Uh, that's before we get to various academic isms associated with different theorists, advocacies, uh, and perspectives. If anything, we have a cacophony of ideologies, and maybe that's what she means. Uh, maybe as ideologies proliferate, um, none is able to provide what Ugrezic provocatively calls a refuge for human imagination. That phrase is provocative 
at least to social scientists, because social scientists don't generally want to see their work in terms of imagination. A lot of scientists would put imagination on a sort of CPO, CP Snow divide from what they do. Um, I read Ugrasich's Refuge for the Human Imagination as expressing what I believe social science actually needs to offer people if it's to be relevant to a non-academic public. And I think if social scientists are going to go on having their own departments, they absolutely need to become relevant to a non-academic <coughs> uh, Brian talked earlier about how sociology of the body ritualistically begins with Descartes. Um, it seems to me that body scholars reverse Descartes and say, my body is, therefore I am. Um, Victoria referred earlier, I think, to, to Antonio Damasio, um, who's very useful in supporting this, this reverse Cartesianism. In Dimaggio's version, as, as I understand it, I am as a body, therefore I think. Uh, the body crucially comes first. But the body is hardly a stable starting point. Body studies, as the handbook I think quite happily comes to, to call it, have always sought to demonstrate the plasticity of the body, which we've heard a good deal about. This plasticity is on the one hand interpretive, having to do with how people understand bodies within broader schemes of meaning, but it's increasingly physiological. I've been attempting in the last months or so, a couple of months, to find something that I can hold on to, something reasonably sensible, um, in the literature on the next generation of medical enhancements. Uh, and skeptical as I am of all of the, the, the utopianism in that, that literature, bioscience does seem close in several areas, uh, close enough so that it's credible to think that some qualitative threshold of body enhancement uh, might not be too far ahead. And, and maybe that'll be in the direction that Patricia was talking about in terms of nanotechnologies. Or maybe it will be something else. And that, that does seem speculative. But I don't think when Agrazich talks about the human imagination, she's referring to this imagination of, of body engineering and the plasticity of the body. The imagination of the body that's always been compelling to me begins in, in what Brian writes about as, as vulnerability and what I've often lumped together as suffering. Ideologies all want bodies to be what their cause demands, whether that involves labor or consumption or piety, which is the subject of several chapters in the handbook. In the ideological version, bodies are there to serve. They serve governments. They serve markets. They often serve churches. The alternative <coughs> is to imagine what serves bodies and start from there. To address that, I really appreciate uh, Brian Turner's recent topology of the four types of human vulnerability. The vulnerability that flesh is prone to through disease, accident, and injury. The vulnerability that comes with human dependency, especially in the early and also the later years of life. And the vulnerability that necessarily attends human interconnectedness. Um, interconnection, expanding the scope of vulnerabilities. I'm vulnerable to your vulnerabilities. And finally, what Brian calls the precariousness of institutions, uh, which at first seems to be, to be quite a different, different type, uh, and refers, I think, very importantly, to those institutions that bodies depend on for nurture and maintenance, whether those are families, schools, hospitals, or expand out to become public utilities and networks of production and distribution. Bodies require these institutions. One of them goes missing, my body will find out about it very, very quickly. My own involvement in what was then, when we started, sociology of the body, began at a moment when I felt most vulnerable myself in the late 1980s, 
uh, when I was putting my career back together again after a hiatus of several years of critical illness. The great question I faced, which I think is faced by, by any academic, especially when you're young, is whether what I needed to say converged sufficiently with what some people were willing to hear. That's our fundamental problem. As, as the public, you know, anytime we go public, do what we want to say converge with, with what who wants to hear? Um, going back to my epigraph from Hugh Grazich, I felt in the late 80s, as I emerged from illness, that my body could provide the imagination for what I wanted to study, but I needed networks in which to make that imagination public. And that's, as I say, that is the, the duality of any kind of writing career, as I understand it. I recovered from cancer um, with the same convictions that many survivors share. And I'll suggest two. First, a sense of the divide between those who know in their bodies and those whose knowledge remains observational. And that's an interesting distinction in light of Victoria's presentation we've just heard, but I'll stick to it. Um, I realized that notions of epistemic privilege are highly troublesome, fraught with problems, but I confess being unable to dispense with some notion of epistemic privilege. There are certain experiences of embodiment that I haven't had, and I would not attempt to write about them, except to observe what seem to be unavoidable similarities. My second post-illness conviction, beyond that there really is a sort of epistemic privilege, uh, is the conviction that while the social sciences have hardly been unobservant of human suffering, social science has not understood, social science has understood suffering from what Pierre Bourdieu characterized so well as the scholastic disposition. That is, the disposition that, that suspends the immediate demands of the situation, thus removing action from the, the sense of necessity, which gives action its particular form as it's lived. We do things because it's necessary to get that done right now. And the scholastic disposition is, is primarily defined by leisure, by not having to get things done right now. I know it doesn't feel leisurely <laughs> when we're in our offices, <laughs> uh, but compared to the, the action position of, of having to move immediately, it, it is. Academics thus tend to fit suffering into other topics, as I said earlier about the body. They tend to fit it into discussions of labor, or war, or religion. And it becomes epiphenomenal to those other discussions. I sought to take suffering as a starting point or a standpoint. I understood sociology of the body as a way of proceeding from that standpoint of suffering bodies. In medical sociology, for example, the enormity of that reversal really can't be overestimated. When I started graduate school, school in the 1970s, there simply was no academic niche no network, no publication opportunities, no grant categories for the experience of being ill. That wasn't on the agenda. There's some very funny moments in prominent medical ethnographies when the sociologist writes about being in the room alone with the patient and being tongue-tied because sociologists study doctors. It was peer-to-peer. -peer, you know? And what do you say if you're, if you're there with, you know, the patient. It's one the category for study. All of this is to say how lucky I was in the late 1980s. Um, I was lucky that Mike Featherstone and Brian Turner had already undertaken very considerable work on the sociology of the body. Mike Featherstone, with incredible generosity, I mean, those days we didn't have email, he, he mailed me my first bibliography of books I, I should be attentive to. On, on the body. Um, they were generous enough to give me a ready-made platform 
for publication. And speaking especially to the younger scholars here today, this is absolutely crucial. Um, but the best networks are those that you discover as if they were ready-made for you. It's kind of like Winnicott's theory of, of the, with the infant discovering the maternal body. It's just, it's just there, designed for you. Um, and that was my incredible good luck. I was also lucky because at that point the patient advocacy movement in healthcare had very recently created a professional milieu in which the so-called patient's voice was being recognized as important. And they were looking for people who could represent that voice in, in conference settings and so on. So here also I found a ready-made network. And finally, I, I published my own first book, which was a, a memoir of my illness experiences, at a particular moment when some especially talented writers had written about their illnesses in particular, the journalist Stuart Alsop, who wrote for Newsweek about his, his own cancer, um, the poet Audre Lorde, the novelist William Styron, uh, the multi-genre talented Reynolds Price. Um, because these people created a market, publishers then were receptive to books like mine. I'm thinking a very Howard Becker argument about, <laughs> about markets, and it's true. It is absolutely true that, that some people have to create markets that other people can then tag along on to. Um, all of this created material for my second book, The Wounded Storyteller, because these, these literary accounts of illness were sufficiently recognized um, so that a book about them would gain recognition, but they hadn't been overworked yet. You know, there hadn't been too much recognition. And that was just timing. To be a bit more specific about the history of body studies that leads up to the present handbook, when Brian founded this particular subspecialty, and I really would say you were the founder of sociology of the body, and in the book that's now going into what is thirty-second edition of the body of society, he presented a topology at the core of it that took as its focal point how societies control bodies. I would call that approach to be generically functionalist, and you can respond to that later. Now, Brian and I shared the same models of scholarship. We're close enough in, in generation, so that it made sense to both of us to put a topology at the center of our work. And I don't think that's necessarily how younger colleagues immediately imagine organizing their work. It's the difference between our generation and, and what's going on now, and, and the concept of theory uh, then and now. So we both put topologies at the center of our work, but unlike Brian, I was coming at body studies from a background in phenomenology. And so my conception of action theory was fundamentally different than, than, than yours. I understood a person's body as presenting that person with specific problems of how to act. Instead of focusing on society's need to control <coughs> bodies, I was interested in how people live with bodies that might go out of control. It's a complete flip of, of what we mean by control. For example, uh, among the, the recent illness memoirs, uh, there's, there's a neat book by a woman named Terry Tracy uh, which has the title, A Great Place for a Seizure. Um, and, and the title is, is an ironic expression of the problem for someone who lives in a body that's always at risk of seizure, as, as hers has been. Living with that risk organizes other actions. It's what I, I mean to be a problem for action. Bodies vary on a continuum between idealized predictability, uh, the, the youthful notion of a body that, that can always control when it needs to go to the bathroom, how much it eats, just when it goes to sleep and wakes up, uh, ideal predictability versus troublesome contingency. I, I understand this as, uh, I understand where a body is placed on this continuum 
as first of all an action problem, but beyond that, it's also an ethical problem. And that's where a lot of sociologists would feel that I was, I was crossing over disciplinary boundaries, but that, that was what I've always wanted to do. It's ethical precisely because, going back to Brian's topology, bodies are mutually vulnerable and they're dependent on each other. Their dependency means their vulnerability is to some degree shared. That's the crucial realization, that our vulnerabilities are not just ours alone. Our vulnerabilities are shared vulnerabilities. Now, everyone will, will be relieved that I'm not going to go back through all of the categories of my 1995 topology. What seems important for, for this somewhat ceremonial occasion of this book is, is to talk about how my, my approach was and remains, I think, teleological. And, and that's a word that we haven't heard in the other two presentations this afternoon. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue uh, that's relevant in, in different ways to, to both of the previous presentations. Um, my present use of teleological was triggered for me by a grant application that I read. Um, but also, if, if I may suggest a, a slight criticism, by what I felt was a bit lacking in the treatment that various topics get in a number of chapters in the handbook. I, I would have liked a lot of the chapters better if they'd been willing to be a little more teleological in the sense that I will now proceed to specify that. The, the applicant of this grant application that I was sent to review, um, I was sent it because he found my work useful uh, as the basis of the research that he was applying to do. But, but in his application, after saying all the ways he found my research useful, he also said, but, you know, Frank, he's teleological. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what? Very interesting. And, and there was no further explanation of that. It, it obviously marked a certain limitation of the extent to which one should be influenced by me. But, um, but it was so taken for granted that it didn't have to be specified. And I thought, well, what is it that teleological, it, it, it was a word that functioned kind of like essentialism during a certain period of feminist study. Like, ooh, was it an ooh word, you know? Oh, he's that. Um, I'm still not sure what he, what he might mean, but what I, what I am really quite positive about is that, that I really like his description of me. Um, I'd really like to embrace that as a, as, as a way of understanding what, what I try to be about. Um, the, the question is, is whether, what count, whether being teleological should count as an objection, um, or whether, go back to Ugrezich, whether work that helps provide a refuge for human imagination is necessarily teleological. If we're trying to provide this refuge for human imagination, don't we have to be, in some sense? Um, I think, I'm guessing, my, my neurons are defective in this sense, um, I, I think that teleology might be a problem for this young scholar because it has associations with some kind of essentialism um, or with an ultimate recourse to particular grand narratives. Um, but I'm really less interested in, in, in that object, whatever the objection was, than in trying to express the terms in which I'm happy to be teleological. Returning to the core problem of suffering, my interest has always been in pointing people toward better ways better ways to suffer themselves and to respond to the suffering of others. It's made my career very simple because that was always what I was trying to do. And if I got lost, I could just always say to myself, so how is this about either helping somebody to find a better way to suffer themselves or a better way to respond to somebody else's suffering? That's it for me. That's all I do. One trick for me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have no doubt there are better ways of suffering, and, and that reflects the side of me that, that's occasionally left academia and spent time in, in therapeutic networks and tried to participate in those. Now, I mean better in a generically Aristotelian sense 
Uh, and this is best expressed for me, given really, I think, really elegant uh, empirical exemplification. In the, the book by an Aristotle scholar, Jonathan Lear, at Harvard, uh, written about the Plains Indians, called Radical Hope. Uh, and the book has the subtitle, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. Lear writes specifically about the last war chief of the Crow, uh, whose name was Plenty Coops. The Crow were a warrior people. Uh, they'd been displaced from, so I think, the Minnesota area out to the, the northern plains. Uh, and were constantly having to fight for territory that they had usurped from, from other groups. Um, their whole life, their collective life, was organized around constant border fighting boundary defense, uh, particularly with the Sioux and, and other, other tribes there. And then, in this immensely sudden change, which is why I'm suspicious of certain evolutionary explanations, because it's just way too fast for evolution, in a sudden change, that way of life was no longer possible. The American government colonized those areas and you simply couldn't be that kind of crow anymore. Uh, I read the problems of the crow as, as roughly analogous to the individual situation of the sort of ill people I'm writing about in The Wounded Storyteller, who suddenly find, and it's very different from people who have disabilities and especially congenital disabilities, my focus has been on people who quite suddenly find that they can no longer engage in the practices the practices that were crucial to their idea of living well. That we constitute our notions of the good life through engagement of particular practices. And then sometimes in a life, the material conditions for those practices evaporate. It just isn't there anymore. And that was the Crow situation. It's useful for me to, to quote Jonathan Lear at, at some length on living according to particular ideals of excellence. Because this expresses the core of, of the kind of teleology that I want to embrace. Lear writes, to take an example from traditional crow culture, being a crow warrior, subjectively understood, was not just a matter of occupying the social role of crow warrior, nor was it merely a matter of being extremely good at being a crow warrior, understood as a social role. To be a crow warrior, one had to fulfill these conditions, but one needed to constitute oneself as a person for whom living up to the relevant ideals constituted who one was. That's the duality at the core of this kind of teleology. Constitute oneself as a person for whom living up to the relevant ideals constituted who one was. This was more than a mere psychological matter of identifying oneself in a particular way. It required a steadfast commitment over much of one's life to organizing one's life in relation to these ideals. End of quote. The problem I get back to, the problem that this, this quotation is situated in, is how do you sustain those ideals after losing the material conditions that have been necessary for persons to engage in practices that shape their bodies? Because crow warfare is about shaping your bodies to the demand of being a warrior, according to those ideals. Humans are always vulnerable to such a loss. If this is cultural devastation, we're always vulnerable to it. I think this is a part of, of Brian's more general category of the precariousness of institutions. The crow to me are the, the nth degree, uh, where the institution is, is your, the whole basis of your material culture. It just collapses. I believe that lives ought to be teleological in Lear's sense of a steadfast commitment stretching over much of one's life to organize one's life in relation 
to certain ideals. If I understand Lear correctly, he's asking what happens to Aristotelian excellence as a teleology that organizes a person's life when the conditions for realizing that excellence cease to exist. And as I said, plenty coops thus faces the same problem faced by people whose lives are interrupted by chronic and critical illness. How do I adapt the ideals that I have lived, lived with to fit the contingencies of my new situation when that situation makes it impossible to engage in the practices that shape my body to be constituted by those ideals? It's a necessarily convoluted sentence because you, you've got to keep showing the, the loop that's built into this. Lenny Coops is a hero for Jonathan Lear because he does find ways to do that. To follow certain psychologists and label what he does as coping, a word I truly am averse to, seems <laughs> um, to miss Lear's point. Um, nor does the, 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 the verb from Talcott Parsons, um, adapt, seem to be <laughs> adequate. I mean, certainly Plenty Coops is adapting. Yes, of course he is. But as I understand Lear's description, Plenty Coops has to discover what ideals were most fundamental, were the fundamental telos of the practices in which he'd organized his life, in order to create new practices. That's his problem, to go back to those practices, take them apart, ask what was the fundamental telos of those practices, and then try to locate new practices in which that telos could be preserved. That, I think, is what Lear means by his subtitle, Ethics in the Face of Cultural Devastation. And as long as we do have devastation, I think we're going to need a word like ethics. If, I under, if this understanding of life that I've, I've just presented with this example is teleological, I would call it either dialogical teleology or with a slightly different emphasis, unfinalized teleology. Both of these terms, dialogical and unfinalized, reflect the, the overwhelming influence of, of Mikhail Bakhtin, the, the Russian literary critic, philosopher, um, on my thinking. Bakhtin, I came to really quite late, and he, he didn't exactly change my ideas, um, but he gave me a former act with theoretical language in which to, to express what I meant by ethics as I used that term in the subtitle of The Wounded Storyteller. In, in Bakhtin, Bakhtinian terms, teleology is dialogical when it is receptive to the polyphony of multiple voices. Dialogical teleology is receptive to a polyphony of multiple voices. Bakhtin argued that the ethical imperative of the dialogical novelist was to avoid what he called finalizing any character. The author must never claim to speak the last word about a character. That was what Bakhtin wanted to, to avoid. And, and whether Dostoevsky is in fact the model of the unfinalizing author or not, we could have another discussion about. He definitely represents, he's Bakhtin's figure, Bakhtin's ideal type, if you want. Um, instead, the author must always leave open the possibility of the character becoming someone else, realizing some other possibility. Plenty Coops is a character who refuses the finalization of being colonized. He refuses to allow colonization to be the ending. And that's his heroism. That's also what I mean by suffering well. To refuse to allow the disease or disability or catastrophe, whatever it is, to be the ending. I've spent the last two decades searching out and writing about characters who I think have suffered well. Um, right now, at this particular moment, my, my protagonist of this uh, is the Greek, Greek hero Philoctetes, um, the subject of Sophocles. 
last play. Um, because I've, I've realized that I can't write well until I've found a protagonist. Um, some people need an idea. They need a character. They need a, they need a persona for this. And, and Philoctetes right now is, is mine. Um, the main criticism of this idea of suffering well, uh, the criticism that I've run into, certainly since The Wounded Storyteller was, was published, and even a bit before, is that it puts another level of demand on people from whom so much is already demanded. Mm -hmm. I have two basic responses to that, both of which get back to this indispensability of tele teleology. My first response is that people find my work when they need it. You know, it's not exactly plastered on the hospital walls. Nevertheless, a lot of people who seem to need it do in fact find it. And, and I think people are, are self-selective and they're self-protective in their selections. Um, and so I, I don't think you really have to worry about putting ideas out there and, and who this will you know, affect, who, who just doesn't need it. Uh, if, if that's too much for you, you'll ignore it. And that's wonderful. Um, my second response is perfectly expressed in Anatole Broyard's um, posthumous memoir, and Breuer wrote, it may not be dying we fear so much, but the diminished self. And that's really, again, the epigram for everything I've done on illness. Um, for better or worse, the human condition seems to require that to avoid being diminished, um, we humans must accept certain demands. That's just, to me, how it works. You know? You can't not be diminished without accepting that, that life is demanding in various ways. To put it another way, I can't understand how a life that refuses teleology can avoid being diminished. Sooner or later, if you refuse teleology, I think your life will inevitably be diminished. At this point, I want to flash forward um, about 15 years to my most recent work on storytelling, bodies led me to stories as I pursued what I, I say in, at the beginning of The Wounded Storyteller, um, and which eventually made its way as a quotation into a nationally syndicated cartoon. I'm, I'm so proud to be one of the few sociologists who's, who's ever been you know, quoted in a nationally syndicated cartoon. That's a great source of pride. Uh, what I wrote was, the, the ill body is certainly not mute. It speaks eloquently in pains and symptoms and, 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 and like Chloe letting us know when she's hungry. Um, but the body is not mute, but it is inarticulate. <laughs> Chloe at this point has a rather limited range of capacities to, to articulate you know, what, her, what her body requires. Bodies thus compel stories. They compel more and more elaborate stories. But any story is inevitably inadequate as an expression of the body. If you want to trace that back theoretically, it's, it's the residual influence of Jacques Lacan on my, my thinking. That I, I really believe the signifier always runs into a, a level of the inadequacy. But I don't think you really need to go back that far. Um, so in a, in a typical displacement of desire, more stories are then told to cover the inadequacy of the story that's being told. Um, and that's, that's the situation of, of many people who are suffering, um, who, who can become immensely tiresome to those around them, because they, they seem to keep going over the same thing over and over again, until you understand this as, as a displacement of, of what can't be spoken. And, and instead of trying to cut off the story, you encourage finding what's still missing in the story, which is the core of what I understand to be narrative therapy in a psychotherapeutic sense. Um, the wounded storyteller, though, still understands stories to be productions of consciousness. Something that we've heard this afternoon is, is highly contentious and somewhat suspect. Um, or at most, um, serving the, the unconscious. In, in letting stories breathe, um, I gave stories a really big upgrade certificate and, um, and, and understood them. At this point, I, I read Actor Network Theory and various things, which was, was very liberating to me. 
And I, I was able to understand stories and bodies as existing in a symbiotic relationship. Stories aren't just there to, to express bodies. In many ways, bodies are there to, to realize stories. Uh, in this symbiotic relationship, each acts upon the other. And this is the Donna Haraway part of my talk, although I won't quote her. She's already been quoted, and hey, you only get so much time this <laughs> afternoon. Um, that's why I now talk about stories as companions, um, following Donna Haraway's more prominent usage. Companion stories <coughs> conduct bodies. And in doing that, they affect how bodies become. That's really like the core of my more recent work, that companion stories conduct our bodies and thus affect how the bodies become. Plenty Coops lost the action capacity for making war, but crucially he retained his companion stories. And his was a narrative genius. He saw how these stories could still be good enough to conduct him in the reimagined version of being a crow. That's what I mean by narrative genius. How do you see how these can still be good companions in radically different material situations? The story of Plenty Coops, the story he enacted by living his life, can then become a good <coughs> companion to people today whose lives require what Lear called radical hope. People, that is, who seem to have lost the capacity to express what made their lives valuable. Um, my wife did a long study of bereaved parents uh, who stand out for me as, as an exemplary group of, of people who've organized their lives around their children and then they're not there anymore. And there may not be a possibility of, of more children. That's what I mean by cultural devastation being a, a very generalized human vulnerability. Um, you can find other examples in, in the book by my, my friend Cheryl Mattingly, an anthropologist, uh, called The Paradox of Hope, in which she's describing the lives of parents of, of critically and chronically ill children, um, who really exemplify another form of radical hope, although Cheryl arrived at that independently of reading Lear. Now, this elevating of stories to the status of, of symbiotic <coughs> companions is good as far as it goes. But eventually it reaches the problem that not all companion stories deserve to be called good stories. That's the issue with which I end my most recent book, Letting Stories Breathe. And it's another variation on this teleology of living well. In thinking about this question of which stories conduct life well, which, that is, are good companion stories, um, my reference point, um, like the great sociologist Max Weber, is, is very often the Hebrew Bible. Um, because when I was a child, it was stories from the Hebrew Bible that were offered to me uh, as, as good companions. Um, but it's important that I was a Protestant child um, being offered <laughs> these Hebrew Bible stories. And so the stories were told to me, this really is very important in my argument, the stories were told to me with a nuance of distance. And I'm very grateful for that now. Um, if the Hebrew Bible stories are good companions, I believe that, that what makes them that is that they mix behaviors. They mix with dazzling speed. <laughs> behaviors that are good, bad, and questionable, to paraphrase Sergio Leone's old film title. <laughs> um, and they leave it to the listener. They very much leave it to the listener to sort these out. Um, when Jacob, after a long night of wrestling, refuses to let go of the angel until he receives a blessing, that's generally speaking good. When Jacob, not that much later in the story, allows his sons to massacre every male in the house of Session, uh, that's bad. Uh, when David, whose <coughs> youth exemplifies all that's good in charisma, uh, ensures the death of Uriah the Hittite, uh, who is the husband of Bathsheba, who you remember David is seen bathing on the roof, um, orders Uriah into the front lines of battle, 
Um, that's very bad. That's a certain nadir of, of badness in the canon. And third, it will always be questionable to me, among the, the questionable behavior, it will always be questionable, questionable to me whether some redactor didn't change the story of, Jake, of Joseph and Potiphar's wife um, to, to make the story read that Potiphar's wife attempts, attempts to seduce Joseph, when for me the, the, log, the narrative logic of the story to that point is that Joseph probably attempted to seduce her. He hasn't thoroughly lost his residual sense of, because I can get away with it. Um, a different form of questionability is exemplified by the, the dark and perhaps most famous story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Here what seems questionable is the perspective from which we hear the story. It's one sort of story if we believe, as Martin Buber was quoted saying about this story, that God spoke to Abraham. If that's our rock bottom reality, where, as Wittgenstein said, our spade is turned, then it's one kind of story. It's another kind of story, if we hear the, the reading that Karen Armstrong has proposed, uh, of, of this occurring in the context of money, multi-generational family dysfunction um, <laughs> marked by recurring violences in each generation, often violences of the older generation against the younger. My point is that the goodness of these stories as companions and the sense in which they exemplify what I'm calling dialogical teleology is their capacity to keep open the question of the good, the bad, and the questionable. Their constant mixing of these three makes dogmatic slumber very difficult when you're reading these stories. As much as these stories constitute a specifically Jewish identity, for all but the most orthodox, they're deeply ironic in the sense that, that Brian defines irony in his recent book as a distance from one's own culture. Um, I have a very <coughs> close friend who's a very orthodox Jew, um, and he's dying, which makes our, our conversations really count. And, and I said to him, is it possible to be an ironic orthodox? <laughs> and he said to me, that's something I really want to think about. I'm just so grateful for that question. Said, that's the question I really needed right now, in what may be the last weeks of his life. Um, it's a Richard Rorty question, of course. And, and I think it's, it's fundamental to what Anthony Appiah calls cosmopolitanism uh, and the viability of, of that as, as an ethic. I think it truly is a question of, of our times. Um, it's a question that cuts through the, the discussions of piety um, in, the, in the handbook. Um, Brian likes irony, and I like irony, um, because, to quote Brian, it's a condition for recognizing the mutual vulnerability of persons. Unless we have some degree of distance from ourselves, we can't recognize the, the vulnerability of, of others living in, in situations so distant from ours. The best companion stories, to me, are ironic in the sense that no final interpretation is ever possible. The story remains at a distance. And that companionship, the companionship of a story that, that holds its interpretation open, has the capacity to make us less certain about our own acts as we perceive the mutuality of vulnerabilities that the act involves. And that's what ethical thinking is to me. It's perceiving the, the play of mutual vulnerabilities implicated in the act. In saying all this about companion stories, I, I reaffirm the title of the first chapter in The Wounded Storyteller, which is Bodies Need Stories. My favorite part of the, the handbook of body studies occurs when we hear stories about particular bodies, because these stories can become our companions. Let me move toward an unfinalized conclusion by saying something about what, for me, were the, the most remarkable stories in the handbook. <coughs> 
The handbooks all seem to have disappeared. They, they've gone up to the wine and the sea. Oh, okay. they, they, they moved to a higher sphere. <laughs> that's, that's so appropriate. Um, the most memorable stories in the handbook for me, uh, my, my Academy Award, to use the seasonal metaphor, um, goes to uh, the chapter by, I think her name would be pronounced Nurit Stadler, um, called Recomposing Decimated Bodies. Stadler describes the practices and the ethics of Israeli uh, Zaka teams, which is an acronym, capital Z-A-K-A, -A, um, teams that go to the sites of terrorist bombing to collect and attempt to, to reunify fragments of bodies that have been blown apart in the attack. The men on these teams are ultra-Orthodox. Um, but again, I, I risk mispronouncing as a great. Um, for whom most of what they do in this work would be considered unacceptably contaminated. The thing they are truly supposed to avoid are even places where, where there may be dead bodies, much less contact. Um, with, with their bodies. Uh, their traditional uh, canons of piety um, would, would completely reject this, the work they're doing. And what I found most moving was Stadler's description of how they've revised the requirements of piety to meet the immediate demands of service. This is happening. And we owe it to the dignity of the people who've been killed in this way to do this work. And that trumps. I think it's appropriate to call this unfinalized piety. Or, again, dialogical piety in that these men hear the voices of the dead. That's their polyphony. The voices of the dead call out to them. And they honor the demands of those voices, even though that regards modifying how they hear other traditional voices that are also in their heads. That's the dialogical part. We have all these voices in our heads. And how do we hear some voices, even if that requires modifying how we hear other voices? Of course, stories can always be told differently. Stadler's de depiction of Zaka teams might well be idealized. Um, and that might matter to a sociologist of Israeli society. What counts for me is that She's telling a story that expands my sense of ethics. Uh, she expands my sense of ethics in the face of another form of cultural devastation. The Zaka teams recognize that piety can retain its core ideals, its telos, while being flexible in the practices that realize those ideals. But you always need practices. You can't live an ethical life without having practices that constitute that ethic. In The Wounded Storyteller, my dialogical teleology um, imagines its ideal in, in what I call the communicative body. The communicative body recognizes that all bodies are vulnerable, but it accepts and even embraces that vulnerability as what allows a depth of relationship between bodies which takes us back to the, the conversation we were just having that uh, Victoria was, was leading us in. To reframe the communicative body in, in narrative terms, it is willing to hear other stories, to respect how lives are lived with their particular companion stories, but also to question when the stories are used to justify and perpetuate forms of suffering as they unquestionably are. Again, some stories make bad companions for some people in certain circumstances. The badness is always in the relationship or the fit. So I end up with my epigraph, the only refuge that remains for the human imagination is the body. What do we need to make that true? Its truth seems to depend upon bodies knowing their own vulnerability to suffering, and thus having, again back to Victoria's presentation, some capacity to recognize suffering in other bodies. Although we do have this immense problem of how readily people can override that recognition and cause suffering to other bodies, which is a real problem for the motor neuron people. 
Uh, like all forms of empathic identification, the recognition of another person's suffering has its gray areas. Practices of piety are good examples. Rituals, prescriptions, and proscriptions effected in the name of piety can inflict what outsiders see as bodily suffering. I like the early motor neuro, mirror neuron theorists believe in, in the universalism of human rights. I think Brian is working really hard to, to believe in the universalism of human rights. Um, but interventions to save others um, have to recognize their own forms of piety and, and need to be undertaken modestly. That's our problem. Sometimes empathy is best when it comes with a bit of irony or reluctance. Um, but there also come moments when others' suffering does, I believe, require interventional response. So here I reach the limit of my own imagination, and I also reach my objection to another kind of teleology. I find it difficult to accept narratives that afford some higher authority with the capacity to trump embodied suffering. That higher authority might be the progress of science, or it might be fidelity to demands of faith. And we could easily cite examples of when both of those have overridden responses to suffering. It might be the political necessity of statecraft, <coughs> or it might be the economic necessity of markets, as some truly appalling things are said in the current presidential nomination. In a world of flux, hard cases, and this goes back to my notion of when you do have to intervene, hard cases can require moments of unfortunate necessity. But as soon as those brief contingent moments solidify into ongoing practices that perpetuate suffering, then I think something has gone badly wrong. So there may be gray areas, but not over time. Over time, we can recognize, I think, without that much grayness, practices that perpetuate suffering. To recognize and address that wrong, the human imagination needs to remain foundationally and teleologically in the body. Bodies can, I think, never be certain, uh, but they may also be the ground of our best certainty. Thank you. Franco's idea of meaning useful in the post recovering by experience? Yeah, you know, I just kind of wish he found a different word. Because as I actually read the book, I mean, it's, it's again kind of jargonistic, but I would rather, when he's talking about our practices, mm -hmm. uh, the problem with, with him using meaning, you all know Victor Frankl's. I think it was for a while the, the biggest non-selling book of the 20th century, non-fiction, <laughs> biggest, <laughs> biggest selling non-fiction book of the 20th century, Man's Search for Meaning, and quite rightly. Um, but as I say, I wish it had, it had been another title, because it, it suggests uh, what was referred to before as proposition, propositional meaning, mm -hmm. uh, or perhaps, you know, creedal meaning, or it, it, it's meaning, unfortunately, I think has, has implications of being too cognitive. And that isn't really what he's talking about. What he's talking about, um, to, to go back to Victoria, are, are people whose mirror neurons are firing even when that, that goes clearly against their own biological self-interest. I mean, when I, if you were to then say to me, okay, so what's the meaning people search for? Mm -hmm. the, the Victor Frankl example that, that overrides for me is, is the person who's starving sharing half of his last crust of bread. Um, and and that's, that also is where something other than evolution seems to be going on. 
um, because it certainly is, is non-Darwinian in, in a classic sense. Um, it's also rather poorly described by the word meaning. Um, so the, the $64,000 question is, how would you retitle Victor Frankl's work? Because mm -hmm. um, man's search for empathic practices doesn't scan. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I were the editor, I'd go, no, Victor, I think you've got to take that one back to. But that's, it definitely comes in, that's, that's what I see as, as being the, the issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, 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 we should, we'll switch halves a bit. Yeah, yeah. This is a Cartesian room. So we, have, we have a definite split on this side. Um, I, have, oh, uh, I have a question about Louis' um, the of the understands ethics in a, um, a Levinasian way, um, and I, I think it's, the reason why Levinas enjoys such popularity is, is exactly your problem of how do we salvage ethics um, from this. And, and you put it in faith-based, one could, one could also talk about it in terms of a rather prescriptive Kantian, um, I mean, enlightenment ethics, which aren't at all faith-based, can, can also have that same rigidity. Of, of the concept of, of duty in a strictly deontological sense. Um, the problem reoccurs there as well. Um, it's, it's Levinas who gives us um, a theory which, which again, um, one, one would love, love to have Levinas come back and, and hear Victoria's presentation um, and, uh, and, and the sense in which he would feel validated in one way and, and also um, might, might have certain objections that I think she articulated. Well, please. Yeah, I was wondering uh, if you were aware, because I'm aware of something in the, in the Jewish traditional writings that the blood itself, when the person is murdered, the blood itself screams up for justice. When you said it was the voice of the dead that made these Orthodox people behave as you didn't expect them they would be inclined. But the blood itself, which speaks to the whole theory of the body talking, mm -hmm. uh, because that's in there's an, I, I wish I could tell you where it is, mm -hmm. but it's, it it seems to relate to this whole conference of yeah. the body having the voice of its own. Yeah. So to just say the blood cries out for justice. Yeah, and what people are trying to express in that kind of 
possibly non-metaphor and possibly metaphor. I mean, it's one of those figures of speech that starts off being really real, uh, and then it then it takes on a, a more metaphorical significance. You know, that's exactly it. There was another question that, yeah, please, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still having a hard time reconciling this search for the body and even the standpoint and a world in flux, and even what um, um, Patricia Call was presenting at the beginning um, of this conference that I think points to more movement and virtuality. And I don't know if I'm stating my question correctly, but I seem to feel that standpoint theory still might need to articulate a little bit of more flux in the positions taken regarding the science and regarding knowledge. So I'm just opening the discussion for everyone. Yeah, um, my, my version of standpoint theory owes more to my Canadian colleague Dorothy Smith, uh, whose, whose version is probably less known than Sandra Harding's. And, and, and Dorothy uh, finds Sandra Harding's version perhaps a little too philosophical for her taste. Um, standpoint theory, to, to me, just, just just means where you start from. I mean, it's, a, it's pretty close to, to what literary people would call point of view. Right. It means it means where you start from and, and where you where you go back to, to to sustain your sense of responsibility. You know, what, what's the what do you hold yourself responsible to? And when you're doing, as as, as all of you know, when you're doing a sustained academic project. Um, remembering where you started is not an easy thing. That's not to be taken for granted. Um, there's, there's a moment, I think, in certainly every big project I've ever done where I sometimes, how did I ever get into this? And, and what was the issue you know, that got me going? And, and I think standpoint theory is, is about doing projects in a way that, that perpetually clarify in the simplest terms um, what, what's the What's the perspective from which you're beginning? And, uh, and, and again, it's a matter of, of dialogical responsibility. Can you add that to your notion of ethics? Well, absolutely. Because it's, it's what saves us from the, uh, the, the, the objections that, that Ella was raising. Um, but, and it, it's why um, I, I think in the, in the early 19th century, um, you know, Bakhtin and Levinas's thinking um, you know, just changed ethics um, crucially. And, and we could have a whole seminar as to where Foucault's sense of ethics fits into all that, because it, it obviously is very heavily grounded in practices. But I, I think it would be an inconclusive I think Foucault just didn't finish. You know, it's just, it's just he, was, he was interrupted in, in the way he might have gone with that. Um, but the other thing I, I would say about your your, your notion of flux, though, is that in most people's lives, things don't move that fast. They may be moving that fast. This is where we have to be very careful about bringing quantum metaphors into you know, lived reality. Um, things, things are not moving that fast in most people's lives. There can be very sudden changes in people's lives. And in that sense, you're absolutely right. And of course, flux has to be be built into this, um, but um, but I, I think we're we're still some some ways away from this this really enchanting metaphor. I love the thing you did with the lectern, you know, and, and how if it were made of nanoparticles. I can you know um, that's that's an abs as I say it, it's enchanting uh, as a fantasy. They don't um, really exist, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, it's a long time. It's a long time between that and, and should we say, commercial applications, and, okay. and it's a very long time before before I can have a nano liver, and um, okay. and, and have it be self regenerating and, uh, and and all of that, um, and that's that, that's a whole separate conversation. But I, I find that's that's still in, in my reading of things that's, that's really way way over the horizon. It's imaginable, mm -hmm. um, but it's still way over you know, the, the horizon for that. So, I, yeah, flux, but, but I, don't, I also 
don't want to get uh, I don't want to get too seduced by um, uh, metaphors that uh, entirely I, I'd rather think of them. that's why I like cultural devastation that that I have a lot of immediate you know empirical reference for you know, that I can point to all around me either at group levels or individual levels I mean, there's a lot about the book, Body and Society, 1984, that embarrasses me. I mean, one of them is the sort of functionalism uh, and the typology. You're absolutely right. But, I mean, you know, our generation felt we had to have typology, etc. Et but it's interesting that your, your trajectory and my trajectory are sort of coming closer together, and namely that we've both been reading Alistair MacIntyre, for example. And it struck me as interesting that McIntyre's Aristotelianism, and he did write a book on the body, um, which was kind of interesting, um, compares, inter compares to Bourdieu's kind of Aristotelianism, because Bourdieu's habitus is, is yeah. an Aristotelian concept, but Bourdieu doesn't want to mix it with morality very much, whereas, I mean, McIntyre's asking the question, what would it be f for a human being to find excellence in modern uh, post-Christian society, as it were. And I think uh, Plenty Coates' solution is quite in interesting in that um, Plenty Coates tries to find a, a, a form of excellence or a, or a morality that will survive cultural catastrophe, which struck me as interesting. Whereas my kind of slightly pessimistic point of view is that Christian piety can't survive modernization. There is no there is no capacity for excellence in a Christian piety sort of solution. Whereas your, I think your book, is, your, your position is more optimistic than mine, which is that um, it's possible for habitus to produce a kind of ex, or it's possible to find an excellence, which for you is something like, um, how could we survive catastrophe with a, a kind of sense of dignity or something like that? Mm, exactly. Yeah. 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 And um, and it's it's a willingness to, to jettison uh, an awful lot of, of whatever the tradition is, yeah. and and to to reread the, the companion stories that you choose to take with you, yeah. um, and and so the question would become whether on the the other side of that rereading, some people would still want to call that being a crow or being yeah. a Christian yeah. or, or or whatever it is or. But, but to me, that's, that's, that's kind of a semantic problem. Um, I mean, I really don't care what you call it. Um, it's, it's still living a life that's, that's organized by, by ideals that are always expressed in various stories that, that then are reread in terms of how those stories find expression in lives. And that's the, the circularity that, that fascinates me the most, is, is how we go from, from story to life to changing the story. And, and so on. Um, people people don't just tell themselves the same companion story over and over again. Um, they're constantly adapting the companion story in their their imaginations. They're constantly making it different uh, according to their needs. And and the person who originally told them the story might be absolutely appalled at at what the adaptation is is now produced as the story that was originally told to them. And that may be what happens with, with certain faith stories, mm -hmm. um, is that, that they, they remain companions, but, but in forms and with implications that, that the original tellers could be, um, e either just simply wouldn't recognize the story at all, or if they did, would be appalled that you, you'd adapted it that way. Before, before Patricia comes in, can I just add one thing, which is that <laughs> one of the things that interests me about people who are in the body studies business is that most of them have had huge catastrophic illnesses of various sorts. I mean, you've had cancer, I had uh, pancreatitis, which was my kind of uh, turning point, as it were. Ken Plummer in this book mm -hmm. tells the story of the liver transplant and so mm -hmm. forth. And, uh, in my own personal experience, I mean, I found this stoic um, survivalism actually the thing that kept me going, because I remember kind of lying in this empty uh, room with this, you know, pancreatitis problem in, in the dark, thinking, well, this is it, and, you know, what am I, how am I going to get through this mess? And um, kind of uh, 
coming to a kind of stoical thing about, well, there's nobody else going to help me, so I better kind of pull myself <laughs> through this and coming out at the other end um, and, you know, wanting to kind of rethink my view of the body as a result of all this. Anyway, Patricia. I mean, uh, I was just, yeah. that it's really true. Trust me, I've been reading illness narratives for, for a very long time now, decades. Um, there seems to be an almost inevitable resentment of, of the ill person, um, even for, for those who were the most dedicated caregivers. And you, you get a, um, a very curious ambivalence at, toward the end of, of almost every illness narrative of, on the one hand, gratitude to these people who've, who've gotten you through, but also, as I say, a, a sense that, that whatever they did, they couldn't have done enough, and they, they didn't do enough. And I, I think that's because there's, there's this moment that Brian just described, um, when, when everybody else seems to have left the building, and, and you're left there. And, and in, the, in, in the memory gestalt of, of the ill person, um, those moments, uh, no matter how fleeting and, and few they may have been, um, take on a foreground primacy. And they're, they're the ones that people refer to and go back to. And, and yeah, Stoicism is, is still still pretty good on that, which is why we have you know so much neo-Stoicism floating around in, in various forms. Excuse me, Patricia. Sorry. No, no, excuse me. <laughs> I was um, uh, thinking two thoughts at once, because Brian gave me another one, but um, I was thinking that you said, after things don't change so fast, that people change their stories and use the word constantly. So I think at the level of what we can change fast, <coughs> we do change fast. You know, there's maybe parts of us that don't change fast, but there's other parts that change, or, like even in our body, are changing at great speeds, even though we don't know it. You know, we're not as conscious of it, although sickness can sometimes make you suddenly conscious of the heartbeat that's different than what before you started to listen to it, you know. So I think the story part for me is into quantum, because you know what, I, I started too with stories, um, is a technology of measure for me, hmm. or even a technology that must, is, is not as material as the body, if we want to be sloppy for a minute. It is the bringing together of a cultural form to the life of the body, our stories have changed incredibly from cinema to television to digital, for instance. I don't know if you see that, and I, I would love to ask you that, if you see that. I guess I was thinking with what Brian said, though, that, and I wanted to ask you before, because there's move, I mean, your, your piece is moving. Um, you know, when you do things like quantum physics, you, don't, you'll, you move like this, but you can't be emotionally moving sometimes. It requires a lot of irony, actually. But I was thinking about psychic illness, you know, um, what it takes, what, what parts of the person, let's say, allows those stories to be a companion towards healing, or what do you do, how do you talk about the capacity to take on a teleology, um, to take on something that's higher. You know, if this, my work has been much more psychological than uh, physical. I mean, the, I'm interested in the the body that is the body of the ego, the ego and the body. You know, the development of the psyche, and you can see such injury to children who hardly can ever find that way again to make an. Error. Although they do too, you know, in a sense, just like sickness. So I was wondering what you do with psychology, which your narrative seems to be sort of holding. Well, first of all, I, I, I want it to be dialogical. You know, that's a, a kind of obvious thing. And a lot of psychologists want that too. Mm -hmm. um, although a huge amount of academic psychological research still radically individualizes yeah. and still has a, an atomistic view of the people. Because it's easier to generate data that way and, and they're under pressure to publish. And, you know, and so they, they just keep doing business that way, especially in the age of Everybody in my university in the psychology department it all seems to be based on using Survey Monkey and, uh, yeah. and, and uh, you know, getting because it's just it's it's you can just generate so much data um, and and so much of academia let's admit it it's it's a it's a production business 
and, and it's really about, about getting what counts as work done. But the, the thoughtful people um, are, are clearly you know, much more dialogical. And, and even though I have enormous differences from Ken Gergen, you know, I think he's, he's also had a uh, extraordinary contribution mm -hmm. uh, in, in opening psychology up to that and it's really presented himself as, as somebody who people could who work people could rally around to, to legitimize that, that movement. So it depends on the, the kind of psychology that, mm -hmm. that, that we're talking about here. Um, but, but no, I think um, what how then is the first part in terms of, of your Oh well I've always been fascinated by narrative as if it's one thing forever and always yeah, and, and how it changes and, and, and the logics of it. Yeah, it's, it's not at all. Um, that's that's what I'm... The, the stories that interest me the most are, are retellings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm especially interested in, in either meta-narratives in the sense of, of a story in which a character tells a story right. and, and the character in the story is, is being affected by the story, which is... That's why I go to memoirs over and over again, because memoirs are, are just full of, of moments in life when the memoirist uh, was living according to a certain story, um, especially stories that circulated in their families of origin, and and then their their increasingly ambivalent relationship um, to the the story that. Families of origin often have stories about ancestors, stories about you know grandparents or great grandparents or so on, and and the children will grow up taking these in, in one sense, and, and then as they come to recognize certain dynamics of their family, uh, as well as uncover counterfactual historical material, um, they'll they'll develop a very different attitude, mm -hmm. um, and and those those stories really fascinate me because a, a lot of memoirs are about working out a different relationship uh, to a story that, that remains yes. inescapable for you yeah. in some way, um, but, but how do you, do you tell your yeah. relationship to it differently um, so that you can continue to, to go on being the person who still was formed in relation to this story, um, but, but who now has significant problems with how the story was originally told to you. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's personal for me. I have a very close relationship with my maternal grandparents. They, they were just wonderful, generous. So much of, of anything that might be good in me was, was from their example. Um, they were also really significantly racist. Um, you know, they, they were from Tennessee. Um, my my great-great-grandfather had, had taken his factory and had it switched over to manufacture arms for the Confederacy. And, and the family stories were very much about um, about how the family's fortunes had declined through the, the Reconstruction period. Now, that's really typical of what a lot of us have to live with. Yeah. And, and it imagines, it, it requires taking those, those early stories and finding um, quite, a, quite a radically different way of, of positioning myself toward those so that I don't have to give up what was genuinely good in my grandparents, um, but I, I can also realize that, that there were some, you know, just extraordinary, you know, blind spots. Is putting it way too, too uh, generously. Um, there, there were some, you know, ethical defects, and, and in a language of ethics, something I like is that we're we're capable of talking about certain people as being defective. Um, you know, yeah. They were just defective in that respect. Was awful things they said, but you know that doesn't negate the fact that, that they were also in, in other ways extraordinary models for me, and that's that's how stories change, and and it's it's this weird embedding of of stories in the sense of particular you know like narrative structures that they told me that were repeated, yeah. you know, including a fine line of jokes, anecdotes, and and family happenings, uh, which are stories in a formal sense, um, and then the the story in the sense of, of the story I tell about my childhood, the, the lived story, the story we're constantly assembling uh, in the course of our actions. Um, so yeah, the, the stories the stories have to keep changing um, because 
God bless us, we, we all have such severe deficiencies of our mirror neuro neurons, <laughs> and, and we're all constantly waking up to the ways in which we, we haven't been firing on, on all of the empathic neurons that we ought to have been firing on, which is, you know, the, the problem with the, 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 um, the first group who uh, Victoria was presenting so well and then taking apart in the second half of her talk. We're not just equipped with this stuff right off. We really do have to learn. We have to have experiences, and we have to learn from those experiences. We have to come in contact with other people. Um, and crucially for me, we have to learn not to be afraid. You know, so much of my life has, has been generated by my fears, and, and then being in situations that, that sometimes allow me to get by those fears. And of course, there are a whole lot I haven't gotten by, which is why I'm only what I am. But, um, but I think you know, fear is just such a huge thing in, uh, in animating human life. And, and our stories help us come to grips with our fears. I mean, that's my, my kind of take on Aristotle's theory of tragedy. You know, our, our stories are our ways of, of living our fears vicariously and, and thus finding ways to, um, to, to, to be less wound up by them. Well, this morning, oh, Frank, Frank said that um, when he was younger, we were, we were criticised for being normative, and um, you know, sociology was not supposed to engage with morality or affect. Or, so anyway, I think you've done a lot to change sociology for the better. So good on you.